Welcome. Um, in this part two of our video lecture on supply and demand, um, we're going to look at uh, some more advanced models of supply and demand. Now, if we were going to go through these models fully, um, there's a lot of mathematics involved, there's a lot of theories involved, and we're not going to really, that's not what's really important here. What I'm going to try to do is kind of cite these five different models and stories about different types of situations that can occur in the economy that are not necessarily found in, let's say, textbook intro economics. And so the idea is that we have to think about kind of odd situations where supply and demand might not operate um, as usual. We talked about a few of these cases when we talked about elasticity, what happens when something is inelastic, which means that uh, it only be, you know, the price will be set mostly by movements in one supply or demand, but not both. Um, and also situations where, let's say, supply and demand have the same slope, and you can get a situation where the more something costs, the more you want it. And that can apply to things like gift registries or when we're buying presents for people. Uh, the more expensive it is, uh, the more attractive it is uh, to the consumer. Now, this is not going to happen all the time. But for example, a lot of the gift industry, things that's like wedding registries and, and uh, gift registries and things of that sort, um, their pricing model is based upon kind of an understanding that is not in the, in the thing. So let me move on and go to our agenda for today. So for our agenda, first of all, is to introduce these five kind of advanced supply and demand models. And as I said, focus on the stories around them. Don't focus, I'll say, necessarily on the math or on the theories involved. We're not here to teach advanced economics. But I think it's important to have these in the back of your head because as a business person, you have to make narratives and stories that explain or, let's say, inform your decision making. We're going to then try to identify what in what situations is each model most applicable. So most of these don't explain everything in economics. They're not a general theory of supply and demand, but they might apply very uh, for certain situations uh, more than others. So for example, in some uh, cases, the search aspect, when you're searching for a match between, let's say, producers, uh, product, and let's say consumers, or producers and consumers, uh, insurance markets are a lot like this, uh, labor markets, when you're looking for workers, are very like this, where kind of, let's say, the resources used in searching to find, let's say, what you're looking for, uh, matter a lot, and that can change the dynamics of supply and demand. And lastly, we're going to talk about the, what are the implications of this for business decision making. So for example, um, if you take a standard supply and demand model, um, there's no reason why you should ever advertise because products, goods, and services advertise themselves. If it's a better value to the consumer, the consumer is going to choose it. Um, they, in a sense, they, they assume that the information is costless, that people will just find the best match for them, and that'll say the equilibrium will occur without any extra effort. Advertising suggests that we um, businesses have to find their customers, that we have to tell them about products. And I think particularly when you think in marketing, one aspect of marketing is just this information that you're giving to people saying, this is our product, this is what it does, this is what, uh, uh, what problems it could solve for you, this is why it's gonna bring you value. And therefore, we can, it all makes us understand what is the value of advertising, what is the value of marketing, and why we might decide to spend money on it, even though it doesn't enhance our product, even though it doesn't necessarily lead directly to sales. So let's talk about the, the five models. Now, I'm gonna throw a lot of different names at you and you know, kind of some background, because this is where these come from. I, you know, I'm not gonna hold you responsible for any of these names. They're just there as kind of additional information. And really what this slide is about is just giving you a nice acronym to remember the five different models. And so I use the acronym ACCORD, A-C-C-O-R-D. And each of these letters stands for one of the five models we're gonna to review today. So A stands for auctioneer, first C for cobweb, second CO for corridor, R for rocking horse, and D for disco. And almost all these people have been um, shortlisted for the, uh, the Nobel Prize for Economics. Other ones have been very influential. Um, and more or less, they were trying to kind of think through how does supply and demand happen and they came up with exceptions that kind of explain certain aspects of it. So for the auctioneer models, what it seems is that the way that the economy is is a series of different auctions where you can imagine an imaginary auctioneer saying, okay, I have you know, five tickets for $100 and then gets no takers, and I got five tickets for $95, $90, $85, and they keep kind of running the auction until they get buyers. And the same thing with, let's say, uh, buyers and sellers are both kind of conducting auctions and to, find, to try to figure out what is the value that we're putting on different products and what is, let's say, the cost uh, to producers to put that into the market. And so if we think of this as just like a whole bunch of people saying, this is the value I put on it. You can think of the economy as one big equation 
where everyone has, let's say, different numbers they're putting on different products. And as we act, we give out information into the economy. And then let's say, you know, marketers and also businesses are collecting that information as well as sending out information to consumers. And by our actions and our behavior, we kind of figure out what the right price and quantity should be. So when we think about like an Adam Smith's invisible hand, this is kind of a systemizing what he's saying that we act in a self-interested way. And by being self-interested, we send out information and that helps organize, let's say, production and what's in the market. Um, let's just let me jump down to D. Uh, the DISCO model, it kind of says that, look, what supply and demand is mostly about matching. You know, matching producers with consumers, matching workers with employers, matching uh, insurance with insurees. And so what happens is that it's a search for the right match. Just like when we go dating, you know, we are who we are. We're all worthy individuals, but very often what happens in a dating situation, we don't necessarily find that individual on our first date or second date. Sometimes it takes time. And that means that when we're looking for products, um, we might have to go out in a search and we're not necessarily going to find it. So when we think we go from store to store or from website to website looking for the right match for a product, we might compare alternatives. And if you look at like a lot of e-commerce, you see this where they you can see people's different ratings for products. They give suggestions for like people who looked at this product also considered that product. And what they're doing is simplifying or reducing the cost of the search in a way to encourage you to make a, uh, make a, um, to make a purchase. And if you think about what a lot of e-commerce apps are doing, uh, e-commerce e apps, which is, means what they're mostly doing is brokering, which means they're in a sense collecting information and with a few questions to you, they suggest, let's say, a certain product that matches your, uh, your needs. Um, and so what they're doing, their value is in reducing the cost of searching for something, whether it's airline tickets, whether it's hotel rooms, whether it's, let's say, um, restaurants, and you have things like Yelp and Angie's List and a variety of different things that provide ratings. And all this is simplifying that information because information is costly very often. And if someone can provide it to you, let's say, at the tip of your fingers, um, that's a value to you and you might be willing to pay for that service, even though they're not actually making the product. They don't have a gain in the product. Their gain is like acting as this, in, uh, this broker between like two parties that are trying to get it together in the economy. And so we'll talk about what it implies if we take the cost of searching for our product or searching for workers or searching for employers uh, seriously. Um, the cobweb model explains, for example, why we have booms and busts, explains why prices kind of go up and down kind of in cycles. And we see this very often um, in commodity markets and oil, whatever, and why we see this kind of um, mismatch between long run and short term. And it kind of builds off what we were talking about elasticities in the last uh, video lecture. Um, and lastly, the rocking horse, which is the idea that, you know, the economy moves around, prices jump up and down, but there seems to be a process by which, let's say, it tries, it's searching for the right price. So even though it's never really there, the prices are not stable. We see things like gasoline prices. We see things like the price of milk and eggs jump up and down. It means that what's happening in the market, there's kind of stock markets particularly move up and down, um, that they might be shaking, kind of like a rocking horse rocks back and forth. But there is a central tendency, like it doesn't, let's say, uh, happen randomly. It kind of varies around a central like position. And so what happens is we have events in the economy, like uh, supply shortages, war, natural disasters, um, storms, things that destroy crops and harvest. And these all have an impact on prices. But these impact on prices is relatively short because eventually it gets it to its long run position. And so if we just wait it out, if we just say, let's ignore what's happening today and let's look at the average over the long term and this is very important in business because we can often get deceived by let's say uh, temporarily prices might be high or low and therefore it's not a good business prospect um, but we can't we don't want to make look at it like this is the entire future we want to say look what is the long-term trend here and make decisions based on that so for example rather than let's say kind of being like lemmings chasing the direction of the market in one direction or the other um, and having kind of a longer term perspective and why that can be valuable. So let's talk about the first model. The first model is basically sees the economy as a series of auctions. And you know, in these auctions, people are getting information about what value they put on different items. And also people put, uh, give out information what, uh, for what price they're willing to provide things into the market. So let's think about this as an auction as like kind of in a dating market. And you know, we're gonna use our, my friends from the Peanuts cartoon with Charlie Brown. Peppermint Patty, Lucy, Marcy, 
uh, etc. Um, and so let's assume that like, you know, Charlie Brown here is the product and we put him up for auction, kind of like a bachelor auction. And we say, look, let's put a price on Charlie Brown. And all of our young ladies say, look, okay, let's put a price on Charlie Brown. And let's say these are the numbers they give. And let's say it's a one to 10 scale. So like someone who doesn't really value Charlie Brown that much might give him a one. Someone who likes Charlie Brown a lot might give him an eight. And then we have different values in between. So we might ask us like, how did the, they come to this, this number, right? Is it just a random number they're throwing out there? Um, it's not like you're uh, competing in the sense that you're trying to get, you know, guess the correct number. So the auctioneer model says, look, everyone in their head has like a little like math equation in their head. And they're like, like think of it as like a mini a, a computer and they have these numbers and they kind of calculate like, what do I like and dislike? And we can think of this equation as maybe processing real things about Charlie Brown. Like we can think of like three variables, A, B, and C. One stands for his level of outer beauty, which I gave him a negative one. He's bald in eighth grade. <laughs> Generally, like life is tough for you if that's, if that's you. Obviously, we're not talking about a real person. Um, we can think of another variable being kind of inner beauty, like he's a nice guy, you know, he's a, he's a good friend, he works hard, etc. And then lastly, we can think about like, you know, what, how much money does he have in his wallet? And we can think about every person puts a different value on these three things and therefore has a different, let's say, math equation in their head where they're plugging this information from Charlie Brown and they plug it into their own equation, which is what they like, and they, and they come out with a number. And so if you actually wanted to take these equations seriously, if you plug these numbers in these equations, you would come out with the different numbers that, you know, they're giving him. So we kind of reduce all this information into a price. And the price is kind of like a, uh, bringing together all the different things that we might value about a product. And that puts our, and then we give that information out back into the market. And then people say, okay, people want this and not this. And they decide what to produce and put into the market. So if we want to think about this and maybe, uh, if you've ever done this in a math class where you've kind of solved a variety of different equations and then one drops out and then you solve for one variable and then you plug that back in, more or less, this is what matrix algebra is. And so we can think of like the economy as a one big matrix of information where we have A, B, and C, the three different values we might have on Charlie Brown. And we have all the different individuals in the market and all their different equations lined up. And let's assume we have a really great computer and it just chugs in this, all this information. And what it spits out is kind of like the price for the market. And that's the one price that, you know, all the demand in the market equals all the supply in the market. And it sets the price and that's the price you see in the store and that's what you're going to be able to buy whatever product is on and it's averaging out from let's say all the different demands from all the different customers and like say all the different alternatives and substitutes for products and then you get your one price now the assumption here is that there's only one price in the market right whenever you solve a math equation right there's only one well i shouldn't say this sometimes there might be more than one value for x um, when you're solving for roots but basically there's one unique solution which means there's one point where the entire system balances and that is quote unquote the market price as opposed to the value that us as individuals we might pay for a different item there's also assumption that this happens automatically that you know we don't have to pay for the computer uh, all these calculations even if you're bad at math kind of happen naturally you don't actually have to solve these equations um, and that the system is basically in equilibrium which means that if we go into a market Okay, there's a correct price and that price doesn't move around a lot. And if you look at products in the market, most products basically have the same price from day to day or week to week, month to month. There's no, even though a lot of things are happening in the market, a lot of things are affecting the cost or the inputs into different pro goods and services. They don't, you don't see the price jump around that much. Most prices are relatively stable. Um, you might see, let's say a gradual increase over time, but the idea here is that you get that one price and that price is pretty stable. So that's the first model. And, you know, this is kind of what's behind the Adam Smith, you know, all this information, invisible hand. And if, what's important here is that if we're looking as a business, we can try to calculate what the demand is by looking at different aspects of, let's say, our customers, how much money they have, what are their demographics. We can do surveys and say, what do they like and dislike? And that's like this product, this process of collecting this information and then creating kind of like, okay, what is the demand for our product? How many units of, of our goods and services can we expect to sell? So when we're doing a, like say market research or let's say what is the demand for our business or product, we're doing something like, like this. We're collecting a lot of information and then we're kind of kind of model about how people are gonna react 
um, into the market. Now, what another part of this is that obviously we have competitors and we can kind of see what would our product do vis-a-vis -vis the other alternatives that customers have um, for our product or good or service in the market. And so if we think about this, this is maybe why we want to value information and how we can use that information to kind of understand what is the demand for our product. So another way to conceive of the market is as a rocking horse. And if you've had a toy like this, um, you know how it operates. If you don't touch the rocking horse, the rocking horse will just stay, you know, stable, even though it's on, let's say, you know, the curved skids. Um, but if you agitate the rocking horse, it's going to move around. It's going to go up and down, back and forth. And we can think of this as kind of how the economy works, is that fundamentally it's at it's an equilibrium. It's at rest. Things aren't moving around. Prices are relatively stable. Things don't change. But every once in a while, there's something that comes from the outside, whether it's an, an oil price shock or a war or an act of terrorism or a pandemic. And this creates a, you know, a lot of uncertainty in the system. It shakes up the system. Um, things are unstable for a while. And these you can think of like it's crises that lead to opportunities and opportunities that can lead to business, business opportunities, which means that you know, when things are being shuffled around, um, things might be less, their prices might be, let's say, all over the place. And that might be the opportunity for a new business that can challenge some existing competitors. So let's just kind of visualize this. So imagine, for example, there's a big shock to the economy. Okay, the rocking horse is going to go back and forth, back and forth. Okay, but eventually what's going to happen is the rocking horse is going to come to a stop. Now to, to simplify the visualization, we can think of this kind of like as a circular skids. And in the bottom of this bowl, actually, the shock will you know move the skids back and forth just like the rocking horse. And we can visualize like the price as being kind of like a little ball that's inside, let's say, this, uh, this semicircle here. And so what happens when you get a big shock, what happens is the price will kind of bounce around up and down, up and down, but smaller and smaller movements, smaller and smaller movements until it kind of finds itself eventually at the bottom. And the key idea of this is that even though, let's say, it seems like the market is shaking all the time, the tendency is towards stability and it want, eventually it's going to find itself in the bottom of the bowl. It's not going to be, let's say, unstable forever. It does have like a re-equilibrating, uh, re uh, an equalizing mechanism. And therefore, the point is, is that this chaos that we might see temporarily is a temporary condition and therefore something to be taken advantage of rather than something that is, let's say, destabilizing. So, what's the implications of the rocking horse model? So the first one is that there's a tendency toward long run equilibrium. And so the rocking horse is like the shock absorbers you have on, on a vehicle. You might hit a bump in the road, the vehicle might shake a little bit, but eventually it gets more stable, more stable, and you get back to kind of an easy ride. So there's an internal economic mechanism, which means the price system is never wrong. It just maybe, let's say off, let's say it's fundamental, it's, it's fundamentals. And so what happens is that the economy, and this is your SAT word for this video lecture, cybernetic. It means it's self-adjusting just like, or self-regulating, kind of like a thermostat in your house. So the way if you set the temperature at a certain degree, what happens is the house may get hotter. If it goes above the set in the thermostat, then it sends a signal to you know the heating and cooling. If it's too hot, it let's say signals to cool it down. It might go, to, go below the set temperature and then it'll heat up. And what's happening is the temperature is bouncing around, but eventually it's gonna find, let's say, a happy equilibrium at the temperature that you set. And this is exactly how the market economy is working as well, that it has kind of a self-adjusting, self-regulating. If you leave it to itself, it'll find a happy medium. And the market operates the same different way. So what's happening here, and the key thing that you want to focus on is that there's this process of price discovery. The market is trying to figure out where the right place is, and because things are agitating it, like, as I say, all these different shocks, oil shocks, wars, etc., things that we don't control, um, are going to, let's say, shake it around. And so it might not actually get there, and therefore there's kind of a friction in the system. They'll keep it off. Um, so the point is that it's not a perfect system. It's not necessarily a well-oiled system. There are kind of some rough patches, but if you can see beyond that, you can, let's say, trust that there's some type of long-term trend that it's, it's trying to reach. So let's go to our third model. And our third model is called the disco model because the metaphor here is kind of like a, like a nightclub or a disco where people go and they're trying to, let's say, find a match. And so the key thing is here is that there's some balance between the two different sides of the search process. So we're going to make this relatively simple in terms of a dating model. We have boys and girls, and we're going to make, let's say, 
the relationship is relatively simple, which means that the the match is one boy, one girl. Obviously, that's not reality, but for the purposes of getting this analogy out, um, we're going to make that kind of assumption. Um, and so what you see here is the supply and demand curve. Um, they don't cross in one spot. They can cross in multiple spots. So just like when you're solving for, let's say, um, an equation and you have multiple roots when you're solving something algebraically, um, is that there might be more than one spot that you can get supply and demand uh, to be equal. So you just don't have like two lines crossing and there's only one point of intersection. There might be multiple points of intersection. And what the DISCO model kind of wants to suggest is that you don't know where it's going to, let's say, find a, a place at rest. It could be here at the top right corner, the bottom left corner, or in the middle. And the key thing here is kind of like who's in the market. Are there enough matches to be made? So if there's a balance between the two sides, like producers and consumers, or let's say workers and employers, okay, everyone gets a match and the market kind of clears because everyone finds what they're looking for. But you could have markets where there's an imbalance, which means producers want to be in the market, but consumers don't. Or for example, workers want to be in the market, but employers don't. And as a result, you get a destabilizing situation, which means you could have a situation, uh, a result where it's all one and not the other. So the point is the market might not form is that you might not be able to find what you're looking for. Uh, for those of you who are older, you know, that's kind of like a U2 song came out in the 1980s. I still haven't found what I'm looking for. And that's more or less what the market is. So just in the sense that a disco is kind of like dating market where people are looking for a match, not everyone finds what they're looking for. So let's imagine once again, we're going to go use my friends from Peanuts and we, let's say we have, a, let's say, an even balance, which means that, you know, everyone can pair off. Everyone's going to be able to find even, let's say, the homeliest person in this little like disco dance or this prom dance is going to find someone to dance with at the end. All they have to do is just say, look, I'll accept whoever's available for me. So the point is, you don't have to be the best, let's say, alternative in the market. You just have to be a alternative and there has to be kind of a match for you. So what's going to happen here is they're all going to pair off and everyone's happy because everyone gets what they're looking for. So think of this as a market where, you know, everyone has a solution to their problem. For every product that I want, there's a product out there that matches every single customer. Now, is this true? Probably not. There's probably some times that temporarily there might not be, let's say, the product that you're looking for at any given time. But, you know, we're going to assume that there's a balance and the balance is created because there's exactly the same number on one side as the other side. So, as, you know, just make this simple. There's the same number of producers as there are consumers um, in this market. And so what happens is, you know, we have boys and girls here. So we have, so the mix of the market is 50% girls, 50% boys. Um, and that leads to the balance overall. So we find ourselves kind of on this middle intersection point where, um, you know, everyone is happy, everyone's stable, everyone finds what they're looking for. But imagine, for example, what would happen if we add one extra boy, which means we're creating an artificial imbalance in the system. Um, and, you know, does this make things better? So now what's happened is, let's say, the, uh, there's more boys, fewer girls in this market uh, in terms of the overall composition. So we have uh, seven boys and still we have our original six uh, females in the market. So what's happening here? And um, you, you think this is like, well, this is great, right? We have one extra addition to the market. This should make everything better. Um, but does it? Well, if you're looking from the girl's perspective here, it's like now they have alternatives, right? They don't have to choose the, the homeliest or the least attractive person of the, all their alternatives. There's a product out there that's not going to be purchased um, as a way of thinking about this. Um, so the point is that you might see from their perspective, this might seem like a better situation, an improvement. And But if you look at the gentleman here, they might think of it as, let's say, um, you know, the situation has gotten worse because now there's a risk that one of them is not going to be able to find a pair in this market. They're not going to be able to find the product that they're looking for uh, or the good or service that they're looking for. Um, you know, someone's going to be left standing by themselves at the ends of the night. And so what is going to happen to the psychology of this search process? Well, what might happen is that you know, there's the person who's actually going to be standing by themselves, but there's probably one other person who doesn't know whether that person or not. There's the last person, and then there's also the second to last person. Uh, most people, their odds haven't changed, but two people at the bottom, their odds have changed. Now they have a 50-50 chance of actually finding their product in the market. And they have to make a decision whether they want to spend the time and resources to search for the match, because now it's not guaranteed. So what's happened is that you're probably going to be What's going to happen is two guys are going to exit the market and then and then what happens is you have an, another imbalance and then maybe some females are going to leave the market and then some more 
and then some more. And then eventually what you're going to have is just one person there by themselves. And you have, let's say, a market that is 100% on one side and 0% of the other side. So what you get is that instead of finding this happy spot in the middle, you might have a tendency toward, let's say, stable but, let's say, suboptimal like, like locations where the market kind of settles. Um, and the greatest example of this is insurance markets or in markets in used goods where one side might have more information than others. There's a famous article called The Market for Lemons where you have used car salesmen. And they, the key here is that would you accept the price that, let's say, a used car salesman offered you for a car? Now, you might think, hey, this price is a good, uh, good bargain, but you probably wouldn't buy a car because if it was underpriced. You probably figured that there's something wrong with it. If it's overpriced, then it's not a bargain. And so the point is that while people might want to sell used cars, um, buyers are probably going to be leery about those pro uh, prospects because they don't know about the quality. So you need to sell something else in here, something like a Carfax that's going to provide some type of information that acts as an assurance so that, you know, that there isn't this information imbalance. But that's kind of the whole idea of being able to search for a product and how that can lead to situations where you might need to do a little bit more to assure people that they want to avail, yourself, avail yourselves of the services that you're trying to sell into the market. So another way of thinking about this is that something that, you know, something that's called ladies night. And, you know, this is just kind of a thing is that why do, um, let's say we have ladies night, which is the kind of idea that uh, women can go to, women do not, don't have to pay for their drinks, but men do. And the idea is that this will make women come to the to the disco to the nightclub, and that what will happen is that that will attract more men to the be, men because there's more women there. The more women there, it becomes more attractive, and then they'll make more sales. Um, they'll make more sales on on the men who are buying their drinks at this uh, bar or disco. Now, the other way of thinking about this is that in certain businesses, they might take a loss. What's sometimes called a loss leader is that they're going to lose money on one of their products, but by losing money on one, they're going to get more customers going through their store, and then they're going to make up the money by increased purchases for other pro uh, products. You see this very often in delicatessens, where they lose money on the sandwiches, because the sandwiches, people go in, I'm going to buy a sandwich, and they lower the price, and they think it's a bargain. But what happens is that then they buy a beverage to go with their sandwich, and that beverage has, let's say, a several hundred percent markup, and so they might lose the money on the sandwiches, but they're going to make the money on the drinks. Um, there's a lot of other things that are what are called loss leaders. They're kind of items that are on sale to bring people into their store. Um, but when what happens is that once they're in the store, they make other types of purchases that they didn't plan. But kind of ladies night is kind of a deliberate attempt to say, look, we're going to lose money by providing something for free or at discounted price. This will then attract other customers into our store, and then there'll be more purchases of a different type. So the idea behind a disco model is that um, and let me just give one more example from health insurance. So imagine, for example, in health insurance, you have a situation where, um, for the most part, the people who want to buy health insurance are sick people. Healthy people don't have a need of health insurance, at least they don't think they do. And like sick people need health insurance because they have a reason to use health care. Now, if you look at it from the opposite side, from the insurance side, um, you know, insurance companies want to sell their product to healthy people who will not make claims, and they don't want to sell their insurance to sick people who are more likely to uh, make claims. So for example, you could have a situation where everyone gets insurance and that means like, and just going from the icons on the bottom row, everyone from old people, granny and grandpa, to people who might have a disability or pre-existing condition to people who are not really couch potatoes and therefore not exercising, uh, families, men more than women, babies, young boys, girls, people with better hygiene, meaning like people who take care of their health, and lastly, maybe athletic people. So the point is that, you know, if you had to choose which people do you want to insure, you're probably going to want to insure the more of the people on the left and less the people on the right. Now, the question is, though, if you're insuring all these people, there's probably no insurance company that wants to sell to all these people uh, because they're going to lose out. Like, you know, if you try to insure older people, they're going to need a high demand for medical services, and there's no premium you could charge them. It's going to cover all their costs. Now, if I start eliminating some of these, let's say, high-risk people, you might find more insurance companies may be willing to insure. Because once you get to, let's say, the healthiest people, everyone wants to insure them. And so what you're seeing here is that you might get a market where um, there's not many people who want to buy insurance, but there's a lot of insurance companies that want to sell it. And so what can happen just we have in the disco situation, we have a situation where we're going to have all buyers um, all buyers, no sellers, all sellers, no buyers. So if you want to visualize this again, kind of in the way we visualize the rocking horse model, 
we can imagine kind of taking that, let's say, the skids of the model and then inverting them. So we have this little ball, the price on top, but it's kind of like resting there, very unstable. And any, you know, uh, disruption to the system is going to knock it off into like a situation where you have all buyers, no sellers. So even a small, let's say, shock is going to knock that off the top and down into, let's say, a suboptimal like location and the market kind of gets stuck there. Same thing for the other things. You can get situations where buyers, no sellers, sellers, all sellers, no buyers. What you want to do is be able to stay at the top, but to do that, you need some type of intervention that's going to keep people there, whether it's by providing a loss leader, by whether it's government regulation, forcing people to buy a product. You need something there to keep people, let's say, in the best position. And the key thing here is that the market is not going to fix itself. You might have to, as a business person, or perhaps as a government regulating in, you have to be able to like do something that's going to keep that like price in the best possible position for the entirety of the market. It's not going to do it on its own. It's not going to be self-correcting as you might thought in the rocking horse model. So what we hear is where we want a situation where sellers equal buy uh, buyers, but that's going to be unstable even if it's the best location for the market and all people involved. So the last thing about the DISCO model is that um, it's a search equilibrium and that if you think of it in terms of pairing and matching, this explains things like, for example, labor markets where people who want to work are unable to find employers who want to hire them and also employers are looking for workers but can't actually find them. And so you see sites like um, Indeed or different types of hiring sites uh, and there's a lot of money in sense promising to get the best resumes in front of you so you can hire the best workers or a best match for the jobs you have. Same thing for workers who are looking for jobs. Um, I just gave you an example of insurers and insurees. You see this in terms of how people look for colleges. Wouldn't the life be easier, for example, if you didn't have to like make college visits and do applications and write college essays and take SATs? All this is a process of searching for the best match between you and a school. At the same time, schools are making a huge effort by sending all, let's say, the uh, literature and brochures and glossies and all those types of things trying to say, look, you should be interested in our college, which you might not know about. There's a huge expenditure in this kind of, let's say, brokering process by trying to bring people together. They're not going to do it naturally is kind of the point here. And this shows you what the importance of marketing is and also the importance of advertising, particularly if you're a new business and you're trying to, let's say, get people in. You have to have a way of getting the information out there and reducing the cost of searching for your uh, new business. So the idea here is that there's markets, but there's also non-markets. You can't just assume that people are going to buy it because you're the best product in the market. You can't just let's say, look, here I have a good idea. I'm going to provide a service. I have a good business plan and people are just going to come through my doors. You're going to have to do something to create the market. And the other thing here is that there's a lot of different places the market can end up. And some of those are not good places, both in terms of the overall economy, but also for your particular business. And that most of the time, uh, the market is not, let's say, in an equilibrium state where everything is stable and everything is predictable. It's going to be chaotic. It's kind of the natural state of affairs because people do not have perfect information. Information is going to be costly and searching for that information takes a long time and people might not be able to actually find what they're looking for. So let's just do a variation of, let's say, the, uh, the DISCO model, the corridor model. And this kind of tries to explain why sometimes we have very easy to work with, friendly pricing, friendly markets that work as we would, you know, the, the economics textbook would tell us, and then sometimes the market acts crazy. And so what this basically is the is a combination of the rocking horse model and a combination of the disco model, saying that in a certain corridor, in a certain location where economic certain economic conditions apply, markets behave pretty well. As you know, you would tell supply and demand works, things equilibrate. Um, if you put a good product out there, you have buyers. However, outside of this corridor, outside of this kind of, let's say, uh, bowl that we have at the top, things can fall off just like we were talking about in terms of, let's say, the DISCO model. So, for example, most of the time prices kind of fluctuate in a narrow band. Um, they move around, but not too much. Um, and we have ups and downs, but they're generally within the range that most people can deal with. Now, the problem is that what happens when you have huge shocks? So, for example, most businesses assume that there's going to be a downturn, okay? There's going to be, let's say, bad conditions. Very few businesses can plan for, like, a pandemic that leads to shutdowns and uh, stoppage of the economies as we've had, let's say, in the past year. Really, no one could plan for a situation of this sort um, because you don't assume, like, the end of the world when you're making a business plan. 
So what happens here is that you can have situations of accelerating deflation, which means kind of like a depression or a recession. We could also have situations of accelerating inflation, which has occurred to some companies, uh, some countries around the world. So when we get certain big shocks um, and we get outside of the corridor, we can have get trapped into those situations. And um, generally, these are between two and 10 percent. Inflation is pretty livable. Outside, outside of those bands, you know, we lose our ability to control the um, control the economy. A lot of this has to do with how effective uh, government's economic policy can be. And then you might also think of these as between 10 and 5% unemployment are about the same bands, depending on how you want to define, let's say, the overall conditions in the economy. So what happens is that you might have a huge shock. It knocks it out of the ball at the top, and you get trapped, let's say, here. And you can see, we'll talk about examples of inflationary trap, but you can also have the alternative where you have like a big shock in the opposite direction, and you can get stuck in an economy that is kind of stuck in low gear and can't escape. Um, and we won't get too much on what those macroeconomic conditions are, but the point is that most of the time we're in this middle corridor, and then when we lead to things like in 2008 or the Great Depression or um, high periods of inflation like they had in the 1920s in Germany and the 1980s in Latin America, um, we might have to have more aggressive, uh, no individual business is going to be able to overcome this simply by uh, having a better, uh, making a better mouth. So the corridor model. Most of the time, the economy fluctuations occur in a narrow band, which means most of the time it acts as normally it's in the corridor. Um, and generally, the Federal Reserve controls the interest rate. And this leads to like a guardrail or a speed bump that prevents the economy from getting out of control. Um, so within the ranges, it acts like the rocking horse. Outside of the ranges, it looks like the disco model. Um, and the key thing about here is expectations. Um, and there's a situation where you have what are called self-fulfilling prophecies, which means that the economy behaves normally if we, be be we believe it behaves normally, which means if we expect the economy to get worse, that you know we change our behavior and that behavior feedbacks into the system. If we we think the economy is going to be inflation, that prices are going to rise. If I think other people are going to raise prices, then I'm going to raise my prices, and they're going to raise their prices, and then I'm going to raise my prices. And you get into a, like a spiral where the economy kind of you know spirals out of control. And so what happens is when you get shocks to the economy, like we have in a pandemic, we can't assume that the market is going to find its uh, is going to heal itself like the rocking horse model would. And so these are the things where you really have to worry about in the business because you know. Uh, those types of periods of chaos aren't going to be, let's say, opportunities. They could be long-term trends where the economy is uh, depressed for an extremely uh, extreme length of time, and it might not be a good business environment, particularly to start a new business. So just kind of, um, this shows you kind of deflationary trap, and just uh, this shows the United States leading into 2008, but also then Japan in the blue line from the early 1990s when their bubble popped. And this is what you might call a deflationary trap where the um, inflation in the economy really goes down to zero below zero, which means the economy is more or less in a stall over a long period of time. Um, the United States was able to get out of this for a variety of different reasons, um, which are beyond, let's say, the video lecture here. Um, but this is kind of what you might see if this thing was developing. Now, just to show you the other side, when you have, let's say, runaway inflation, this shows you a variety of different countries, um, Brazil and Argentina during the 1980s, um, Zimbabwe in the late 80s, early 90s, and then Yugoslavia in the 1990s. And what you see here is in terms of their exchange rates, which means their currency in terms of dollars went from, let's say, one or 100 uh, uh, units of their currency, the dollar, to um, uh, quintillions or quadrillions of, of units of their currency compared to the dollar. Um, particularly, you see, let's say, the case in Brazil. And so this is kind of the situation where you have runaway inflation. And a way of thinking about this is that prices are rising so fast that if you sit down at a restaurant and it takes you half an hour to finish your meal versus an hour to finish your meal, um, the price of the meal will be different. And that's how fast prices are changing. So you get situations where people don't have printed menus because menu, literally the price is changing all the time and people are writing on chalkboards giving the updated prices of the meal. Um, in 1920s in Germany, prices were people were doing wheelbarrows of cash um, and they were going home two or three times a day to cash their paychecks uh, because prices were kind of infl uh, were inflating so quickly that basically people couldn't understand what currency was valuable. And what happens is the currency economy breaks down 
and people more or less resort to barter situations, um, which means that economic transactions are going to be a lot more inefficient. So uh, the last model that I'm going to talk about is what's called the cobweb model. And the cobweb model is called that way because of the shape that it makes on the supply and demand curve. So the axes are the supply and demand curves, and then you kind of see the path by which prices adjust. Um, and so either they spin in toward equilibrium or they spin out toward disequilibrium. And this explains like kind of the ups, ups and down cycles in the economy. So this kind of has to do with what I called elasticity before, but I'm gonna just make it kind of put in simple terms. Basically, if the slope of the supply curve is greater than the slope of the demand curve, the process of adjustment is an inward spiral to price stability, which means it kind of acts like the rocking horse in this case. Um, and what this is driven by is a, the, uh, the, uh, the thing when long-term supply and short-term supply are, are, are not in harmony with each other and when supply and demand decisions are not made at the same time. So the classic example of this would be when you're a farmer, you make the decision of how much to, to plant in the spring, okay, and that's what you, that determines how much supply of a certain product that might will be available, but you don't know what the demand for your harvest, your, your demand for your product is until the harvest, which is several months later. And because there's not, not happening at the same time, there could be a disjuncture between supply and demand that's gonna to lead to boom and bust cycles. So in the alternative, if the slope of the supply curve is less than the slope of demand, what you're gonna get is kind of an outward spiral and that's gonna to lead to price instability. Um, and this is what happens with like boom and bust cycles. And you, there's several things that kind of uh, fit this pattern. So for example, um, there's a time lag between supply and demand. So that you see this very often in agriculture where um, the reason why you have future mar futures markets, which people buy future harvests instead of, let's say, letting the free market determine the price of agricultural goods um, is because people plant in the spring, uh, roughly, and they harvest in the fall. And therefore, the costs and benefits are not happening at the same time or under the same market conditions. Uh, you see this in terms of the labor markets because you have to decide now what skills you want to develop by choosing your major, by choosing your focus, um, but you're not going to actually enter the job market until four or five, six years down the road when the demand for a certain set of skills might be different. Um, this particularly happened in the late 70s. Because we actually had too many engineers. And as a result, by having too many engineers, what happened is people weren't willing to pay engineers a lot because there were too many of them looking for a relatively small number of jobs. And so what a lot of these engineers did is they didn't get careers in engineering. They went into things like Wall Street and used their mathematical skills to something else. Um, but the point is what happened is there was a decrease as a result because engineers weren't able to get employed as engineers. Um, they basically, uh, people stopped majoring in engineering. And as a result, you know, in the next 10, 20 years, we had a, a shortage of engineers in this country. Um, you can see this sometimes in terms of stock markets, particularly in products that involve technology, is that people have to make uncertain investments up front, not knowing whether people will actually want to buy their their killer app or their new technology. And so you can see boom or bust cycles. Now, if you just want to visualize this over time, is that if you have a spiral inward price stability, you're going to see fluctuations that over time that look like this. And if you think about what the cobweb is kind of a circle, and if you think about what you might have learned in math class, you have the unit circle. And if you plot the unit circle, you're going to get like a sine function or a cosine function. Um, more or less, that's what's happening here. So when you, in the sine function, cosine function, you have fluctuations, but basically you have the same peaks and troughs. But in terms of a spiral, where it's getting wider each time, not the same circle, um, you might get like this fluctuation pattern. Where you have, let's say, the price stability, like the rocking horse, you're gonna see the, the ch uh, changes get smaller and smaller over time, and eventually they find their, their long-term price you know, target. However, what happens in some of the cases that I was talking about is that you could have a spiral that's getting out of control where the, the changes are going to become bigger and bigger over time and less and less predictable. And as a result, the market is going to fall apart because people really don't know what supply and demand are because either it's going to be booming or busting. And that can be too unstable for, let's say, a long-term um, long um, opportunity. So if you're going to a business that might have this aspect in this, you don't have to decide whether you can like survive today or maybe you're going to business on the boom but you have to make sure that you're able to survive the bust. And if the busts are getting bigger and bigger each time, you have to make sure you have the resources to last through the kind of that downturn in the economy, which is gonna become even more severe over time. So the, what you need to be able to do is gonna increase over time. 
So that's where we're going to wrap up this kind of advanced uh, approach to supply and demand. I'll see you next time, and we'll talk a little bit more about monopolies, monopolistic competition, and branding.